welcome back. And today we're right back onto the Wang Rider and uh, there's, there's some pretty exciting stuff to show you guys. Uh, in the previous episode, we left off with it saying Holorold on the uh, bottom of the monitor and we didn't do anything too tricky to get it to do that. Uh, whenever the bootstrap ROM on the C CPU board uh, reads the floppy, the entry point is at uh, ha address hex 0200. And if we look at the code that is at address 0200, on an archive disk, which I have a couple of. Uh, there's a little routine there that initializes the monitor and gets all of the ducks in a row. And then it has a little bit of ASCII that it displays to say not a system disk. And uh, this is just a little message to let you know that you booted the machine without the system disk in. So you need to turn the machine off, pull the archive disk out, put a system disk in and reboot the machine. Once the machine is fully booted up, you then pull the system disk out, put your archive disk in, and then you can read and pull your saved files off of that. So all I did was I took the ASCII data that was in there, not a system disk, deleted it and replaced it with Holorold, and well, there we go. It was really simple and, you know, I said it, it kicks the door open to doing a lot more complex things, but uh, I had no idea how wide we actually kicked that door open. Because this is a Z80 machine, uh, a lot of the really hard work of figuring out how to deal with the processor and how it, how it handles communication within the machine is already taken care of. We just have to know Z80 assembly. I don't know Z80 assembly, but there are some very, very smart people out there who do. So I want to show you guys some neat Z80 assembly programs that we've got running on there. So let's hop over to the machine and uh, let's take a look at some of the programs that a member of the Discord 256 byte RAM has written because they are awesome. So let's hop over there and get started. All right, first things first, I mentioned him just a second ago, but uh, 256 byte RAM, that's his username on the Discord chat group, gets all of the credit for this episode. Uh, he is incredibly smart uh, and very well versed in Z80 uh, assembly, and he already had a Z80 assembly based uh, project that he was working on. And uh, once he started taking a look at the uh, bootstrap ROM that's on the Wang writer here, he went, you know what, this feels very familiar. Uh, and then from there, he took his uh, project that he already had, he had a Z80 emulator going on for it. He pivoted that Z80 emulator to build a uh, emulator for the Wang Rider, and from there it was time to start tackling some of the unknowns. Now we knew how to write text to the monitor, so that's output. The next important thing to figure out is input. So we need to figure out what the scan codes coming from the keyboard into the system are. So 256 byte RAM got to work and wrote a little assembly program here. All I need to do is uh, copy this to a blank disk, put it into the system, and it should uh, essentially print the scan code for the key I press on the monitor. Now there was some pretty tricky stuff that had to be figured out here, like how to initialize the keyboard and how the keyboard strobing and all of that stuff works. And I'm gonna be honest, a lot of this is way, way over my head. Uh, I really love playing with hardware, but when it comes to software, I am very much so out of my depth. Uh, but 256 byte RAM is an absolute genius and, and really, really good at this stuff. There's gonna be a link in the description below to the full assembly for this. So if you're curious about what's going on, all of the information's down there. But what I wanna do is I wanna get this onto a floppy. And well, honestly, I've actually already got it onto a floppy. I used the grease weasel that we used in the previous episode to put it on a floppy. So let's pop that floppy into the drive turn the machine on and start writing down all of the scan codes for the keyboard so I can then uh, forward them onto 256 byte RAM and we can get into much more tricky stuff from there. So let's pop that floppy in and see what happens. All right, we'll flip the power on. The cooling fan has kicked on. Oh, it's reading from the floppy. 
Uh, okay, so it's finished reading from the floppy. Uh, we haven't displayed anything on here yet, but maybe it's waiting for an input from the keyboard. So we'll hit a key. Uh, that's not displaying anything. Oh, I suddenly got two. I got 5C and 5B. So R says 5C, T is 5B. Y doesn't work. E, Q, W, these don't work. Uh, oh, we get uh, D and just D. D is 4D. Uh, I think this is actually a failing of the keyboard and not of the software. Um, I think we have a lot of dead keys on this keyboard. Uh, it seems like the majority of them don't work. When I was cleaning this up, I got curious what kind of key switches were in here, and they're all Keytronic key switches. And uh, Keytronics are foam and foil key switches, and those are notorious for going bad. I'm willing to bet that we have a large number of very bad key switches in here. So it's time to take this keyboard completely apart and replace all the foam and foil pads in there with new ones, which uh, thankfully you can get off of Texelec. All right, first let's remove the uh, little Wang word processor uh, beauty piece that's sitting along the top. That'll give us access to three screws that are underneath it. With uh, those three screws removed, the outer case lifts right off. And this gives us a good look at the keyboard itself and those uh, notorious Keytronic switches. Next, in order to get the uh, full keyboard out of the case completely, there's just four screws. Then we'll disconnect the cable that goes to the PC itself, and then the keys in the PCB will lift right on out. And then if we flip the whole thing over on the back, there are about 40 little screws that uh, hold the PCB firmly to the key switch assembly. And with all of those removed, the uh, PCB lifts right off. Uh, this is actually the first time I've ever had to repair a foam and foil keyboard because it's uh, one of the first foam and foil keyboards I've ever had. The Centurion all uses Cherry mechanical switches. My TI-99 is using Alps mechanical switches. So it's uh, very interesting for me to see uh, this type of keyboard. Uh, and the way that it works is that underneath uh, each key here, there's a a couple of exposed uh, pads here, and they don't actually connect to each other. We have a really large half moon on one side, a really large half moon on the other side, and then there's an exposed trace that runs right through the middle of them. All that really matters is that when you press a key, uh, it pushes down and pushes this little conductive pad into this surface here, making a connection across them. And now that pad has a piece of foam underneath it. This is a, a little replacement piece here. And you can see it is simply just a piece of foam that is squishy with a little conductive pad on it. And this is where we have failed. These are pretty notorious for the uh, conductive pad going bad. And we can see that on most of these, the conductive pad isn't even there anymore. So there's no conduction going on at all. So what we need to do is we gotta go through and pop each one of these out and then pop the replacement conductive pad in and that should completely fix it. While we've got the uh, keyboard PCB out here, there's some pretty interesting chips on here. This one over here is a 30293E-013. Now I couldn't find hardly any information uh, on this chip. I believe it's a microcontroller of some type. That would make sense given its size and the fact that it's socketed. The other large socketed chip over here is a 6042. This is a uh, UART chip. So this is a serial interface that goes uh, between the computer itself and the keyboard. And that makes sense given how few of connections that we have over here. Now down here, we've got an InterDesign 900C. I have absolutely no clue what kind of IC that is. I uh, tried Googling it and couldn't find anything about it, but it has a, a very nice ceramic package. The IC right next to it is a CD4051. This is a uh, multiplexer chip. Um, and then the rest of these are 7400 series uh, logic ICs. Uh, and then we have 
probably the uh, largest two megahertz crystal can I've ever seen. That's really cool up there. All right, we've got the keyboard all back together and it feels mushy, I guess. That's how uh, foam and foil keyboards feel, I guess. Uh, but let's kick the power on and see if our scan code program works again. And uh, it should be working now. Nothing's gonna display until we type something. So uh, let's just hit a button here. Yeah, yeah, there we go. 6E, so the number one is 6E. Number two is 6D, three is 6C, four is 6B. I, I think I'm seeing a pattern here. Uh, so let's do Q. Uh, Q is 5F, W is 5E, E is 5D, R is 5C. Again, I'm seeing a pattern, uh, but it looks like all of the keys are working. So let's type uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Exclamation point, exclamation point is EE. -E. Man, it sure looks like everything is working perfectly. That's awesome. We managed to uh, completely repair this keyboard. So next I need to go through and write down what each scan code is for each key, make a list and send that over to 256 Byte Ram because he's been working on something really special. I've been working really closely with uh, 256 Byte RAM to get some uh, hopefully pretty special stuff happening with this machine, and he has sacrificed far too much sleep for this, and for that I am eternally grateful. Thank you so, so much. Uh, but I, I think he's got something really special cooked up for this, and so uh, I think we need to run it. But in order to do that, we have to get his uh, image file, which is just a, a, a binary file that he supplied me with, we need to get that from this laptop onto a disk. So I've got the machine on here, I've got my Grease Weasel plugged in here, and we're in the uh, Grease Weasel folder on the Windows PowerShell here. Now I have to use the command line for this next bit because uh, we had to make a custom uh, implementation of the Grease Weasel software to actually work with the Ring Biter correctly. In the previous episode, I used the Sega SF7000 format to uh, read off of the disc, and that worked fine. It read uh, both head zero and head one for 39 tracks, and the format was correct. However, when I write back to a disc using the same format, it only writes on head zero. It doesn't write head one. So I have no idea why the read operation works with both heads, but the write operation doesn't. Uh, so 256 byte RAM again had to uh, battle through the Python of the uh, Grease Weasel software and come up with a custom format for us so that we can write new images to disks. And uh, we've got it working. So let's go ahead and write his image file to a disk. So at the command line here, I'm going to type dot slash gw dot exe and then tell it that it is a write operation. And then we're gonna put in a bunch of arguments here. The first is we're gonna tell it that the device is com4, the drive is drive number zero, our format is the uh, custom Wang Writer format that uh, 256 Byte RAM made for us. Uh, and then the tracks are going to go from track zero to track 39, and we're going to use heads zero and one so that we're writing both sides of the floppy. And then finally, we need to tell it what file to uh, write to that floppy, and that is going to be uh, 256br.img that I have saved on my desktop. All right, that should be everything. Let's hit enter and uh, hopefully it goes. That's good news, it shows format ring writer. It says writing track, track 0.0, .0 track 0 0.1. I can hear it slowly stepping through. It's writing, a, uh, it's writing a new image file on there. So all we gotta do is sit back and wait for this to finish. All right, there we go, all tracks verified. Uh, so let's turn the power off here. Uh, I'm going to disconnect the grease weasel. Uh, we'll just set that right up there. And then I'm gonna plug the uh, ribbon cable back into the uh, Wang Rider itself. And uh, well, now all we gotta do is flip the power back on and see what happens. Uh, I can see uh, the junk that's in the DRAM is being displayed that's in the video circuit. Uh, that should be cleared. Yeah, it got cleared right there. I can hear the drive reading, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> yes, there we go. 
47K CPM 2.2, and now we have a prompt. Let's type DIR, hit enter, and there we go. That's right, 256 byte RAM wrote a fully working CPM BIOS for the Wang Rider. How awesome is that? Now, I am not uh, extremely familiar with CPM, but I do recognize uh, this word right here, Zork. So let's type Zork1, hit enter, and see what happens. Zork1, the great underground empire. West of house, you're standing in an open field west of a white house with a boarded front door. There's a small mailbox here. Let's open that mailbox. Opening the small mailbox reveals a leaflet. Let's read the leaflet. Welcome to Zork. Zork is a game of adventure, danger, and low cunning. In it, you will explore some of the most amazing territory ever seen by mortals. No computer should be without one. There it is, Zork running on CPM on a 1981 Wang Rider. That is something that I did not think was possible a month ago. And a 256 byte RAM is an absolute legend. Came out of nowhere with this and it works beautifully. Well, I say it works beautifully. We still are not out of the woods yet which I guess is a fitting pun given that we're talking about Zork, but uh, there's still some problems going on with this, uh, particularly with the uh, floppy read routines that we have uh, going on in CPM here. If I let it sit on a prompt for too long, whether it's in Zork or just on the regular A, uh, a prompt, I get a BDOS error. So there's some strange uh, floppy problems that we're still trying to figure out, but uh, it is absolutely stunning that it actually works as well as it does because 256 byte RAM wrote this and he's on the other side of the planet without having one of these at his disposal. So I am still absolutely blown away that this is possible. Uh, now, another thing that you may have picked up on is that it said 47K CPM 2.2. 47K is referring to the amount of RAM available, but that seems weird because if we remember, this machine has 96K available. And so why, why can't we use all of that 96K? Uh, well, turns out that the way that uh, Wang organized the RAM in the actual uh, Wang Rider here doesn't play well with CPM. CPM essentially builds from the top down. So we start at address FFFF and work our way down. But even a 16-bit address is not enough to get to 96K of RAM. The 16-bit address only gets us to 64K of RAM. So we actually have extra uh, paged RAM tables that we use a specific setting to flip through the pages of. And that paged memory is between address 8000 and BFFF. Uh, this is a problem because that is the topmost memory location. Uh, why can't we write to C000 to FFFF? Well, that's where the CRT display memory is. That whole chunk of RAM is inaccessible to us. Uh, so the topmost portion of RAM that we write to starts at BFFF. And if we put our CPM uh, uh, install there, I guess it's not really an install, but if we put our CPM in that RAM area and then we flip the page to another page of memory, our CPM <laughs> goes away. Uh, so there might be some tricky ways to get around this, like uh, writing uh, a copy of CPM to each page, but I think that brings with it a lot more problems that I'm not foreseeing. Uh, so for right now, we're just, we're treating those uh, paged banks as just one single bank of 16K. Uh, so that is where the CPM sits, and then we have uh, the rest of the RAM where we can run particularly important things regarding CPM or programs or things like that. So that's why we're all the way down to 47K. Now, this is our own custom homebrew built uh, version of CPM BIOS for the uh, Wang Rider, but Wang actually did make a copy of CPM 2.2 for this machine. I just haven't been able to come across it, but I would be really interested to see how they dealt with this as well, because 47K is 
really not a huge amount of RAM. And that might actually start getting taxing if we wanna run uh, software like say WordStar, a uh, word processing uh, piece of software. And uh, we may end up actually running out of additional RAM space if we start trying to figure out how to put uh, printer drivers and stuff like that into this CPM install. But using uh, WordStar on a Wang writer is, it just doesn't feel right, does it? Uh, this is a word processing machine. It is meant for word processing, which means that it has an extremely capable word processing software that is supposed to be running on it. And if we're running WordStar, it feels, uh, it just doesn't feel right. So, well, I think we need to try and get our hands on a system disk and well, the search has been going for that and uh, I think we're making some pretty good progress. So good in fact that I think the very next episode is going to be all about that search. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the very next episode because it is also going to be on the Wang Rider and we've got even more exciting stuff to talk about in that one. So thank you guys so much and I hope to see you then.